Okay, ladies, welcome back. We are in chapter four. And we just do a little recap of where we are in like thematically. Um, so Raveno Bachiat to here had told us um, the, about the application of trust of bitachon in areas that have to do with, is there a password? Hold on. Hold on. Hmm, we should have trouble getting in. Let's give it a minute. Let's give it a minute. In the meantime, while she joins, and before I do the recap, I actually want to share with you something really, really exciting. I think, Tavia, you're in the loop already. Um, but I had told you last week about this conversation that we had with this couple, the Felix, my husband and I, but I don't think I told you what the context, because I couldn't let the cat out of the bag yet. But the context of the conversation is that there is now a Gate of Trust podcast hosted by my husband and his friend. And the first interview, the first show aired um, yesterday. And I hope that you all go and listen and give it a follow. Yes, it's a podcast. You can find it on Apple Podcasts. Um, Liz, do you have Apple or do you use Android? Otherwise, it's on Spotify and probably in all the other. Thanks for the clap. Yeah, it's very exciting. And that interview in particular, um, yeah, so perfect. So you can just um, go to the Apple, you know, the little purple podcast little thingy here and just uh, type search gate of, gate of trust and then you could just click follow so you never miss an episode and that first interview is um is pretty awesome uh so i think you're going to enjoy it and hopefully it'll continue to help us um and you'll hear from the couple who actually sponsored this book this the, this edition of this thousand year old book that we've been learning and the the way they talked about Bitachon and the impact it's had on their lives is really, really very beautiful. So I really, really encourage you um, ladies to go take a listen. Plus they're, they're raffling off a copy of the book and they're also giving a 25% discount on the book, a discount code. So it's really very exciting. And um, I actually look forward to the amazing interviews that they've lined up. And there's also going to be content. I know my husband has produced a lot of content on the text itself. So I'm assuming it's going to be on the podcast. If not, it's probably just going to be on the Gate of Trust website, but I'll keep you posted on that. So with that, give it a, give it a shout out, uh, share it with a friend, share it on social media. Again, I think it's important that we, as we, as we start seeing that this is such an empowering tool that really changes our lives and changes the way we're approaching things, challenges that come up and we're dealing with them, um, it behooves us to also share with others. And with that, I'll also share that today was the 11th of Nisan. Now it's already later, so now it's the 12th. But um, today was the day marking the, hundred, the 120th birthday of the Lubavitcher Rebbe of Blessed Memory. So it would have been his 120th birthday. And so it, as we know in, in in, in Judaism, 120 has a big significance. So it's a very, very big year of celebration. And um, there's a lot of, a lot that we can say about that, but I have severe allergies. I don't know if you noticed, and I wanna keep, I wanna keep to the text just because I'm not feeling good. Um, another day we can um, touch more of, on other things, but um, I sent an email recently I don't know if anybody saw it yet because I only sent it late today referring to today's the significance of today's date and there's a lot to be, to be said about that but one of the things that's interesting to note is that since 1978 this day the 11th day of the Hebrew month of Nissan has has been declared by the U.S. Congress and by the every U.S. president since as education and sharing day in America which is a really, really special thing. And considering all the other days that we have around um, that I don't think contribute too much to our well being, I think the focus of this day is one that everybody can reflect on. And um, the idea of the day was to recognize, to re let me just read you from my email if I have it. I don't even have it. 
but it was to recognize the Rebbe's contribution to education in America. Um, it was a day to encourage people to live by the message of Lubavitcher Rebbe left, left us about education, first and foremost being that children and adults, obviously, um, the first thing that we need to recognize is that we've been sent here by a God who is an, a God who is empowering every individual with a mission, with a godly mission, and entrusting us with a tremendous sense of responsibility to contribute to his world. And with that awareness that there is a God in the universe and that a child's life is not random and that a child is responsible and accountable to a higher authority with that moral compass, then that is the foundation of education. Um, that is what is going to set a child into adulthood with a strong moral compass, with a strong sense of responsibility. And interestingly enough, we saw what happened today in New York, which I haven't kept up with the news because I've been so scattered brain with Passover and just the images were just so horrific. And I had my children with me the whole day. They're not in school anymore. So I just, I couldn't I couldn't, and I don't know that I want to, but what did become evident in my mind as I was you know, driving around town doing my Passover errands, pre-Passover errands, is how important it is for all of us to take the message of today being a day marked um, for education um, with the education, meaning the perspective that I just shared, uh, how important it is for us to take that to heart and to share that and make our own corner of the world a better corner of the world and each in their own way. But I, it's evident that the Revis message has yet to seep every corner of society. And um, the, you know, the beauty that is inherent in creation is still quite hidden and opaque. And I think, I think it's time. I think it's time that um, we we take it to heart um, and and ever you know obviously I'm I'm, pro I'm <laughs> what, what is that phrase preaching to the choir like I'm talking to the wrong crowd because I know we all get this right <laughs> but um, but it is important that we that we recognize it so maybe you didn't know that it was uh, um, that today was marked in America as such unfortunately it seems like a lot of America doesn't know that. Um, so with that, and being that I have allergies and I said I will stick to topic, the topic of today is dealing with loneliness. So we had, I just started a recap a few minutes ago, we had left off where Rabbeinu Bachia was giving us the context of um, when we have to apply trust, when is trust applied in matters of the world to come and in matters of this world. And there were several sub subdivisions to that. I'm not gonna go through them, um, all of them right now, but it was like things that we do in this world that impact, that have to do just with this world and things that have to do, that we do in this world that have to do with the world to come. And then there was, there's going to be later things that have to do with our world to come. And for now, we're still dealing with the things that pertain to this world. And so far he had started us off by number one, Bitachon trust in with regards to our own existence, to our own body, right? And then we had moved into our things, our material prosperity, our livelihood. And that's when we have talked about, so we've talked about health, we've talked about wealth. And now he's, we're going to, and when then last class, we started talking about the things that pertain, the, 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 the third, um, the third um, concentric circle, so to speak, is our relationships with others, um, our family, our friends, our acquaintances, everybody that we have a relationship with. Um, so we are on page 148 on chapter four. Sorry, Sherry's here. And, um, and we're going to now start, we had dealt with, um, we had dealt with sustenance up till now, but now we're gonna start relationships. So I'm, I'm in the bottom of 148 dealing with loneliness. If he is estranged, living alone, then he should connect with God at the time of his loneliness. 
And you should rely on God in his state of estrangement. Thank you, Tavia. Yes, I thought it was fabulous too. I'm glad you liked it. I thought it was so, so good. Um, so yeah, Sherry, you missed that. But um, Matt and Felix started a Gate of Trust podcast. So you probably want to tune in and subscribe because um, it's going to be amazing. So back to the text. So we're dealing with a person who is lonely. So he should trust in God. What is the reflection that he should um, uh, apply to himself? What is the meditation sort of speak? Before, last, last, in, in last week's class, we had talked about the reflection, the reflection or the, the thoughts that he should implant in himself if he's, his funds were either he was lacking in sustenance or the sustenance was coming in a way that he didn't really enjoy or want. Those were those reflections. Now he's going to give us a reflection of when he is a lonely, he is lonely. So he should say to himself, page 149, in order to comfort himself, he should dwell on the fact that the soul is also estranged in this world and that all the people of the world are considered as strangers in it. So this is referring to the fact that the soul comes into this world and this world has nothing to do with the world of souls and nothing to do is it completely the opposite, right? And the soul is sent down here on a mission. And it's very, it's actually quite hard for the soul to depart from where it is basking in Hashem's glory, completely united um, with Hashem to come to this place where it's still united with God, evidently, but it's going to experience what is the word I'm looking for? Concealment. Thank you. It's going to, what am I thinking? Um, it's, I'm thinking Hashem for giving me the word. It's going to experience concealment. Okay. And it's, and it's coming into a, in an environment that is opposing what the soul is inherently. Right. So it's a stranger here. So Rabbi Nabaka is saying, you know what? You are inherently a stranger because you are a you're a soul, not a body. So if you you don't have the relationships right now for whatever reason, you have to remember that you came alone and you're going to leave alone because a soul is not a body and a soul is not material. It's com it's completely different. As the verse says, for you are strangers and temporary residents with me. Furthermore, he should comfort himself in the following manner. He should think to himself that even all these people, those people who have closed ones in this world, will in a short amount of time revert to being strangers and alone. And neither a person's closed one nor his child will be able to help him then, nor will they be able to connect with him. So it's it's funny because I was studying, um, I told you last week that Matt and I have been doing what the Felix um, told us about. And we're, we're learning a page of Shara B'Tach from the Gate of Trust every morning. And we were like thinking, wow, this is so depressing in a way, right? But in, a, in another way, it really isn't. It, it really is a, a, a flip of a paradigm, right? So there's no room for depression here, right? And for everything that you're going through, he's going to give us a, a, a way to frame it, right? To create that positivity bias where you can be satisfied where you are, where you can trust that you are safe and you're in the right place that you need to be at the right time. So in this case, so listen, you're, you're going to be alone. You, like I said before, you came alone, you'll leave alone. Eventually, everyone passes away, right? Um, and even if you live a long time, you're probably gonna out, yeah, you're gonna outlive members of your family, right? Or you're gonna leave before members of your family, right? So any 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 solace or any benefit that you can derive from those relationships are in a way temporary. Not to say that that's not important, but again, we're just focusing on the person who is struggling with that challenge, right? What is the reflection that they should that they should have and we need to understand that this whole world is completely temporary and these relationships which are very important again i just don't i don't want to i don't want to confuse and i don't want to mis mislead anybody but nevertheless they are also temporary let's continue inside after this he should think about the fact that due to living alone the weight of those people's loads meaning the people you're you you have you would have relationships with responsibilities and needs have been has been removed from him so now he's going to tell us listen 
Furthermore, when you have these responsibilities, when you have a family to support, et cetera, et cetera, or employees to provide for, et cetera, et cetera, that is in and of itself, quote unquote, a burden, right? It's, it's, it's not a burden, but it's a responsibility. So in this case, the positive side of this is that you don't have that responsibility. He should consider this removal, the removal of the responsibility, to be one of the kindnesses of the creator to him. So again, he's always bringing us back to this fact that God, everything that God does is good, right? And that's the foundation of everything. It's that emuna, that belief that God is with us and that God does only good. And so if you're in, a pos in any situation that you are now, it's really a kindness from the creator, okay? Or if he is a person who pursues worldly matters and its needs, his work will be much less of a strain on him if he does not have a wife and children. So let's say you're a person that you want to pursue those, the, you know, things of the material world. When you have a wife and children, you're going to have a bigger strain, right? Think about a person who doesn't, right? And doesn't have that level of responsibility. In a sense, things are quote unquote easier in that realm. Again, we're not saying that, it, that one is better than the other. It's let, focus on the situation that you have at hand and see that there is good in it. And there's a, re, there's a good reason why God has put you in it. And for now, you should think that, oh, that is part of the good here. Like I don't have that quote unquote burden. It emerges that the lack of wife and children is the cause for his rest and for his own good. So evidently he can get a little, he can get more sleep. He has less stress. If he's the person who seeks the matters of the world to come. So, okay. So he's not, he's a very spiritual person and all he wants to do is learn Torah and do spiritual things, right? He doesn't want to be bitten too much engaged with this world. So then his mind will without a doubt be more unoccupied and free to pursue these matters when he is alone than if he had a family with which he busied himself, right? So you can see, you consider the life of somebody before marriage and after marriage, especially somebody who's involved in Torah learning, right? Before a, a man gets married, and he's focusing just on his Torah learning. He's, he's just, that's what he should be focusing on. But that's, that's, that's all the responsibility he has. And his life changes dramatically when he gets married and has children and he has to be engaged in this world in order to support his family and do other constructive things that the family unit requires and demands of him. So it's a different time in his life and it's a different level of responsibility that is unique to each time period. Um, again, not to say that one is better than the other, although we could have a whole conversation about that, but that's not the point that Rabbi Nobach is trying to make here is on a comparison. It's just, again, how he should focus if he, at this point in his life, is finding that he doesn't have those relationships. So for some reason, those, that is good for him, either because he doesn't have the stress of the, that, that having to be involved in the world and support others might cause him or because he just has his time to pursue spiritual pursuits without being concerned with supporting others. This is why the ascetics would flee from their relatives and houses to the mountains so they could free their minds to focus on the service of God. So we're about to get to a pretty funny and strange part of the book because, you know, in this day and age, we don't talk too much about asceticism because it's not um, it, it's not something that we, that that is encouraged um, by any means. Um, but you know, there was a time when asceticism or asceticism, i don't know how to pronounce it. Okay, <laughs> but it was it, you know the, these things were practiced. So Rabbi Noah is going to tell us now a really funniest example. But before he tells us that, he's going to talk about the prophets. We know that the prophets very often in order to receive prophecy, they had to leave their families. They had to leave matters that had to do with the world. Like if you think of a person who's involved with a, with a family and a household, you know, there's just so much things that go on that have nothing to do with lofty ideals. You know, it's, think about now preparing for Passover, right? Like 
I, I know how busy it can be both for the husband and the wife and running errands and taking out garbage and preparing and cashing things and preparing for that. There's so much physical activity, right? And, 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 and it doesn't even have to be Passover. I, overall, right? Be, by being involved in the matters of a family. So in this case, he's telling us, listen, the ascetics used to flee from their relatives and go to a far off place so that their minds could be free and they could actually service, um, they actually could focus on their service of Hashem. Similarly, the prophets at the time of prophecy would leave their places of residence and seclude themselves so they could free their minds to ponder fulfilling the obligations imposed on them by the creator. An example of this is Elisha, when Elijah came to anoint him as his successor. As you know from the story of Elijah and Elisha, about whom the verse states, 12 yokes were before him and he was with the 12. Since Elijah sub subtly hinted to him that he would be a prophet, Elisha understood him and said, please allow me to kiss my father and my mother and I will go after you. And the following verse states, and he followed Elijah and ministered to him. So in, as soon as he realized that he was about to become a prophet, he said goodbye and he took leave of his family because that's what needed to happen to fulfill that role. Again, we, we can't relate so much to this, but we have to understand that Rabbi Bahia is trying to give us a point that we can all relate to, which is if your situation is one where you don't have those relationships, and by the way, it's interesting, I write a column for the Herald Boys, I've been writing it for, I don't even know, it's probably five years already, um, for sure four, for sure four or more, um, and I've gotten several emails. A lot of the readership of the, the newspaper, the Herald Voice that I, the Jewish Herald Voice that I write for is, um, is elderly, I would say. Um, and I've gotten a few emails over the years of people who share that they are very lonely. And it's, it's been a hard conversation to have, to be quite honest with you. Um, but I just, as I'm reading this with you guys, I'm thinking that Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar is speaking to exactly the, that person. Um, maybe I should find those emails and email them back. Um, but anyway, all right. So now he's gonna give us a pretty funny story. And I say funny because when you when you read it, you can be like, what, this is so weird. So I, I just, I, I'm just reminded of the fact that to, that in today's podcast, the Gate of Trust podcast, um, in the interview with, with Getsy Felic, he said, oh my gosh, and he has so much humor in the book. He's right, actually. <laughs> this book actually has some really humorous things. If, if you get that, it, it's, it's, it, that, that it is humorous, okay? So the story that he's about to share, it's funny. And it's like this, the story is told of an ascetic who went to a certain country to teach its inhabitants about the correct way to serve God. Again, what? Like we can't relate to this because this is not really what we preach. It's not really what is necessary in the world right now, especially if we go back to the message of the Rebbe, right? This is totally contrary to the message of the Rebbe in terms of how we need to deal with the world. It's not through asceticism. This is not the service of the Jewish people at the time when we're almost at the arrival of the Messianic era. On the contrary, it's the complete opposite. It's, it's, it's full engagement with the world. Um, but um, here's the example. So this ascetic is going to go teach others how to be uh, ascetics, how to serve God in this world. And so what does he find? So he found that they were all wearing the same color clothing and ornaments. Can you even imagine like how horrible that is? <laughs> so everybody's wearing the same color. Everybody looks exact clothes. Everybody looks exactly the same. Then it gets better. Their grave sides were next to the doors of their homes and he, and he did not see any women among them. So here he goes to a town. There's no women. People, are, there's only men. They are wearing the same color clothing and their grave sides are right outside their front steps. So you have a house and a grave, like waiting for the person. It's not full yet. It's not filled yet, um, <laughs> but it, it's, it's, it's there ready for the person. So he asked them about this and they replied, the reason why we all wear the same color clothing so that it should not be distinguishable between the poor and the rich. And so that the rich will not end up arrogant and boastful about his wealth. And so that the poor will not despise himself and he should think of his life on this earth in the same manner as when he will be underneath it 
after his passing, right? Okay, so so it's it's an interesting perspective. Okay, so we shouldn't distinguish between poor and rich, and you know we all know that. It, that looks are in a way deceiving and, it, and, it, and, it, and we are physical as physical beings we judge through through our eyes right and so we can judge people and people also can um exude a certain um arrogant appearance by the way they can they can maybe um, sh um clothe themselves and present themselves in a way that is perhaps superior than others right? It could really boast a smell of arrogance. And the poor might, might, um, might feel really, really bad about themselves, right? Because they don't have that style of clothing or that whatever, right? Um, and so that's why they did it. There should be no differences between these people. And people, people should understand that we are, you know, this, this, this is, this is temporary. Um, and um, and we're all going to pass away in the same exam. We're going to end up in the same exact place. It is said about one of the kings that he would mingle among his servants and could not be identified among them because he conducted himself humbly in regard to the clothes and ornaments that he wore. So not not just the people in the city were doing this, but even the king would also disguise himself. He wouldn't dress himself as king and obviously we know that a king dresses in a certain way right that we see very clearly the position of the king who is the king around here right so here even the king was dressed like everybody else and nobody could identify him among the servants because he was wearing the same humble clothes as everybody else now why the gravestones why the gravesites next to their doors as to the reason why we placed our gravesites next to the doors of our houses, it is in order that we should take rebuke from it by being ready for death and to prepare for ourselves the provisions that will bring us to the place of rest. So it's like a like a, like a wake up call. Like it's just reminding them that this could end in any minute. Like we have to utilize every day in the best way possible because this is totally temporary, right? And and of course, it, it's just a visual reminder. And that's what makes it so funny because you can think like, wow, like, of course, if I had that perspective all the time, how would I behave differently, right? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. And I don't know that we want to do that. But there is a certain, there's a certain um, interesting perspective here of maybe, maybe it is incumbent upon each of us to kind of take pause from time to time and reflect on that, on how temporary it is, um, our time here, and how we have a responsibility to maximize every minute and use it for the good. So they were doing this, they were preparing themselves for the world to come. Now, again, we've talked about this many times. We are not really here in this world to accumulate brownie points for the world to come, but we're talking about aesthetics. So aesthetics, in a way, that's exactly what they're doing, right? They're removing themselves completely from this world because their only concern is to accumulate brownie points for the world to come. Now, there's no women. And this is really, really funny. That which you notice, I mean, depends how you look. You, you could look at it as Okay, I'm not going to say anything. That which you notice that we separate ourselves from our wives and children, you should know that we designated a city for them nearby. Okay, so there's, it's not that there's no wife and children, it's that they're in a separate town. When one of us needs something from them, he goes to them and takes care of his needs and then, and he then returns to us. Okay, I told you it was funny. It's actually really weird, but it's funny. We did this because we saw the trees, much loss, great exertion, and toil, the stress, not the trees. <laughs> we saw the stress. We did this because we saw the stress, much loss, great, much loss, great exertion, and toil that would come to us as a result of being in proximity to them. So again, being close to their family, to their children and their wives, there's too much to do. There's like the laundry that needs to be done and there's garbage that needs to take out and there's like helping with the children and there's grocery. And like, I think about this week of Pesach. There's just too much to do. So this is just, it's, it's not conducive to spirituality, okay? According to an ascetic, okay? This is an ascetic perspective. This is not the perspective that you and I need to have. It's an ascetic perspective. Um, and the 
relief from all of this due to our distance from them, enabling us to be free to choose to engage in matters of the world to come and to detest the matters of this world. Their words found favor in the eyes of the ascetic who had visited. And remember, there's ascetic, an ascetic that's coming to teach them how to become ascetic. So the ascetic learned a big lesson here. And he blessed them and praised them for their practices. Okay, so he found that they're, in a way, doing it even better than maybe he could have suggested. Obviously, this is just to say the point that if you don't have a family at this moment, in a way, it's easier for you. You don't have that burden and you can dedicate your life to more spiritual pursuits. Okay, so that is part of that reflection. Now, if you do have, so before we just discussed if you're lonely, but if you do have this burden of responsibility, if, you, if God has given you the family, the friends, the social network, the employees, all the things, how do you apply the tough one? So if the person trusting in God has a wife, family, family members, friends, and enemies, then he should rely on God to save him from the burden usually associated with being involved with them. And he should make efforts to meet his obligations towards them and to take care of their wants and to do so wholeheartedly. So he should trust that God is going to make it easy for him, that it's not going to feel like a burden. Like, yeah, it's a responsibility, but it shouldn't be a burdensome responsibility. He should avoid doing anything that will cause them harm. Instead, he should engage in the means that will bring them good, and he should be loyal to them regarding all their matters. So don't take a position of complaint and feeling like these people are there to hinder your growth and to to derail you from, you know, from what you want and you need. No, on the contrary, God has put them in your life because that's exactly what you need for your growth. So if God didn't put them in your life, it's because that's what you need for your growth, for your spiritual growth in this world, right? That happens in this world, believe it or not, right? Whether you want it or not. And if God did put them in your life, it's because that's what's good for you and to, for your spiritual growth. He should teach them the appropriate way to conduct themselves, both in Torah manners, matters and in worldly matters, which will benefit them in their service of their creator. As it is written, you shall love your fellow as yourself. And as it says in the preceding verse, you should not hate your brother in your heart. So if you have these people in your life, then understand that part of that responsibility is to guide them to be a role model and to guide them in the right path of life, right? We talked about that at the beginning about education um, day and the emphasis on education being something that is centered on understanding that there's a bug, that there's a God above you and the responsibility that you have as a creation that God has given you um, this gift of life every single second, then that comes with the responsibility, right? And that you're not, it's not, it's not a free ride here. It, there is meaning and purpose because you have a God in the world. If there was no God in the world, well, first of all, you wouldn't be here. But the fact that you've been put here every millisecond means that there is meaning and purpose. So therefore, live with meaning and purpose, right? So, if, 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 so going back to the text. So if you have these people in your life, it's because you have to model that for them. You have to model you have to model you have to teach it how do you teach it, you teach it by modeling that you are conducting yourself and they should conduct themselves in the right way and um as it is written of course you shall love your fellow as yourself so which is we could have classes and classes and classes just discussing this and it's funny that rabbi Novakia is um is 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 citing this mitzvah right here because if we go back to yudalat nissan to the 11th day of nissan and the 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 Rebbe's um, approach, the entire approach, right? The the fact that they the the U.S. Congress and the U.S. presidents have have marked his birthday as Education and Sharing Day is because of this approach, because of the uh, Rebbe's approach to love your fellow as yourself. That if you're here, it's not just for yourself. It's for you to love each and every individual in the world because we're all one, because God is one, right? We're not separate. We're completely united. And therefore, just like you have self-love, you have to also love another human being. And it's a very hard thing to do if you understand like how much you love yourself, right? 
You mean that I have to love and I have to think about other people's needs in the same way as, uh, as myself? It's an incredible, it's an incredible work. But that's what the Rebbe wanted the world to understand, that because there's unity in the world, because we are all one, therefore the natural state of every human being is to be united. Is it's, it's love your fellow as yourself. When you're living an illusion, if you're separating yourself from others, if you're not caring for each other, that's not the natural state. That's an illusionary state. And we have to revert back to the essence of who everybody is, right? So I, I didn't even realize that this was going to come up, but nothing is, obviously nothing is coincidence. And this is all divine providence that this is right here on the text, which evidently is much older than um, the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He should not do so with the hope that his favors will be repaid to him. So he's not doing this in order to gain brownie points of any, not, not spiritual or not material, not to repay them for the good that they already did to him. It should not be done out of love for the honor and praise that they will give him, nor in order to rule over them. Rather, it should be done to fulfill the mitzvah of the creator to observe his covenant and his instructions concerning them, right? It's, he should do it because God said, like, this is how we behave. This is how that, that, that is the blueprint. And that's why we do it. If we've been given these relationships, then that's what we need to do. A person with trust understands that this is what they, they do. Why? Again, because I'm trusting a creator who gave me a blueprint, as we've said many, many times. Therefore, it inherently, in order to trust means that I inherently will trust the blueprint. I can't say I trust in God and then not trust the blueprint that he, what he told me that is right for me. We've, we've said this several times. For a person who performs their request while having in mind one of the aforementioned selfish reasons will not achieve his own desires that he expected from them in this world, he will have toiled for nothing and he will lose his reward in the world to come. So if a person is doing it for selfish reasons and is not doing it um, being um, nullified to the will of his creator, then it, it, it's, it's, not, it's not working. Like you're just, you're doing it for yourself. You're not doing it, connecting yourself to the one above, right? So it's completely different. So you can be, again, you can be, you can go through life being me-centered or you can go through life being God-centered. And God-centered looks at what does God want from me at every single moment, right? What positive action I need to do in every single situation? And how do I stay plugged to that positive reality, to that godly reality, even when the world around me is throwing all sorts of fires and, and, and you know, shooting God knows what, right? How do I stay connected to that reality? A person who has these ulterior motives, meaning wants reward, um, will not receive what he's expecting. It will, it will emerge that he worked hard for no reason and he won't even be rewarded for his charitable deeds in the world to come. However, if his conduct in the above is solely for the sake of divine service, then God will help them repay him in this world. And he will place in their mouths this person's praise and God will make him great in their eyes. So there will be a reward if he actually is doing it l'shem shemayim, if he's doing it for, because it's God's will. Additionally, he will also arrive at his great reward in the world to come, as God said to King Solomon, and I have also given you that which you have not asked, both riches and honor. So we have to understand that everything that we do in the world has a consequence, and it has a consequence both in this world and in the spiritual realms. So and there's an exact accounting, right? And there's going to be some consequence and some reward that we're going to experience spiritually when we're only soul again, right? And while we are physical in a physical body, also there will be a reward. Now, for sometimes we could get derailed into the question, and I think we've sort of addressed it other times, but sometimes that reward is very hard to see. Like we, we can't see it because it's not in, a, in, in the greatest packaging, but it is somehow without us understanding how it is, there is, it's all being measured and it's all happening in the way that needs to happen. And that's what the, that's what the book is trying to kind of instill in us. Okay, so let's talk about people helping people, the next section. 
However, page 158, the manner with which to have bitachon in God regarding the matters that pertain to someone who is of a superior or subordinate class of people, the proper way to conduct himself with them is as follows. So if you are the boss, quote unquote, or if you are the employee, <laughs> one or the other, how do, you, how do you relate to others? When the need arises for a person to make a request from either his superior or his subordinate, he should rely on God to deliver his request and consider those people of whom he made the request to be merely the messenger that God will use to complete his request. So again, we go back to this perspective. So now you have relationships in this world and you're going to have to interact with, the, with these people. And there are going to be people around you who are going to have more, quote unquote, power. And there are going to be people around you who are going to have more, less, quote unquote, power, right? There's, there's going to be, there, there's, there's, there's a pecking order, right? There, there's a pecking order around our social relationships, right? So when we're in that situation where we're making a request of those people, what is the framework? The framework is always this, please God, help me understand along the path of this relationship that th this person is just a messenger for your will and whatever is your will, will happen no matter what. It might be through this person or it might not be, but I should never fall into the trap, please God, of thinking that this person has any consequence, right? Or it's, it's the cause, there's no causality. We go back to this point of the book that there's no real causality within the world. The only causality is with Hashem, with God. So they can't cause anything to happen to me. And so my perspective, how does Bittachon apply? When I have these relationships, my perspective, my perspective has to be, these people are only messengers of God to carry on his will. Just as a person who chooses working the land and sowing it to be the means for his livelihood, in which case, if the creator wishes that he be sustained by it, then the seed will sprout forth and be fruitful and multiply. So he's comparing it to agriculture. So you have people, relationships with people. If, if you also, if you plant, you understand that only if God blesses you that that seed will reap fruit, then it will. If he doesn't, then it won't. Nevertheless, it is obvious that he shouldn't give thanks to the earth for this. Rather, thanks are owed to the creator alone. If, however, God does not wish to sustain him from it, then the earth will not sprout forth any vegetation. Alternatively, it will sprout forth vegetation, vegetation, but something adverse will happen to it, right? So either, either the land will give you fruit or it won't give you fruit because God doesn't want you to give you fruit or it'll give fruit, but it's not it's something that you got to keep. It'll, it, 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 for some reason, something will happen that it won't get to you because if it's God's will that you don't get that at that moment, who that means, you won't. In both of the cases, it is obvious that the earth is not to blame. So the messenger is not to blame. Therefore, in your relationships, you can't be upset of somebody else. Yes, of course, we can always say the person has free will, which they do, right? But we have to remember, that's why it's so, it's so important to remind ourselves that anger is the epitome of um, idol worship. Why? Because when we get angry, what are we doing? We're saying that something else is in control. Because if we understood that nothing can happen to me if God doesn't will it, then I can't be angry at another person or another circumstance, right? Or most likely it's another person, right? We can't be angry because, again, God didn't want it to come this way or whatever it might needed to happen, right? So the minute I get angry, it's like I'm leaving God out of the picture. Like who's in control here? Since when are you in control? Since when is this other human person, other person in control? So instead of focusing there, we have to look upwards. We have to focus on the fact that everything is happening by God's will and by God's design. Therefore, when he requests an object from one of these people who is either above him or below him, he should consider the weak person and the strong person as equally able to perform his request. This is really important, right? So don't even think so. Again, this goes back to something that we had said about how it impacts human relationships in terms of the boundaries, right? So don't delude yourself that one person has more 
power than another person because again they all messengers and only god has the power so you can make all those sorts of calculations about how things are going to come about it's like that i was telling you about that interview that i did with daniel levin the guy who um uh, negotiates um uh, does hostage negotiations and finds proof of life of, of individuals that get um kidnapped and kidnapped in in war-torn countries right and he, and he was sharing with me like I'm, I'm, a, I'm an awful judge of character. The longer I do this, the more I realize that I can never judge anyone because I'm most likely going to be wrong because I have been in situations where people who I knew or I thought had tremendous power to get me the information or to get me to that prisoner of war or to get, did, didn't do anything. And people who I assumed had zero power, zero way to help me save this person, actually did so it's it was so interesting to hear him but that's exactly what rabbi Nebuch is saying here don't don't delude yourself don't, don't start placing trust right quote unquote on one person over another because they're both messengers he should rely on god blessed be he that his request will be fulfilled so again it's me i have relationships and i have a certain request i have some i have a certain want or a certain need right so it goes straight to God because we are Jews, right? We are connected and we have a, 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 a direct line connection to the one who can fulfill the request. Don't fool yourself and create a, 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 a blockage in the connection, right? By deluding yourself and thinking that somebody else can fulfill your request because it's not so. So you can just ease, you can just manage your relationships with ease Knowing that if your request is going to be fulfilled, God has it all orchestrated. You can have healthy relationships without getting bugged down whether this person returned your phone call or didn't return your phone call or looked at you funny or didn't laugh at your joke or didn't text you back or did you don't you don't have to stress about any of it. You can just go about your day, have your healthy relationships, and know that whatever needs, whatever you need, God is taking care of. So access the direct line. And don't, don't, don't block the connection. Don't block the line. Don't, don't, don't get on another call when and leave the line open for God. If his, if his request is fulfilled by one of the people, then he should thank the creator. So don't, don't thank the UPS guy who brought the package that your mother sent. Thank your mother. He should thank the creator. Blessed be he who fulfilled his wishes. He should also thank for two reasons, the person through whom the favor was done. And we've talked about this. Evidently, we have to have a car set up. We have to be grateful people, right? One, for his good heartedness. And two, for the fact that the creator brought his benefits through him. So one, because the person used his free choice in a way that was positive for you. And two, because he, he actually became a messenger of Hashem. So that's a beautiful thing, right? Um, so he needs to be thanked. We, he needs to be shown appreciation. But, but again, we, but first and foremost, we have to thank, um, we have to thank God above for it is well known that generally speaking, the cre speaking, the creator does not cause good to come to other people except, except through the righteous and only rarely does he cause loss through them. So now that he's saying, and, and, and note that there's good in the person who, who just, acted out as an intermediary because if there's kindness the revealed kindness that came from a person is because there's 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 a lot of good there so you, so feel feel do feel respect and admiration in a way for that person right because that's how god does things the author quotes both the talmud and scripture as proof for this principle as our sages of blessed memory said merit is brought about by means of a person who's meritorious and liability is brought about by means of a person who is liable. Similarly, it says, no wrong shall be caused for the righteous. So basically, we have to thank, yes, the people who do kindness towards us um, because they acted as, God, as God's messengers. But first and foremost, we, like I said, we have to be cognizant of the fact that they are not causing the result. And the only one who is putting them in that position that they're able to help us is God. And the same happens with us, right? But to recognize that God puts us in positions where we are the messengers and we are the ones who are able to help other people, which is also very humbling and a very important way to internalizing this, to connect to Hashem, to be conscious and cognizant of the fact that 
I am an emissary of Hashem. I'm not doing this. There's no greatness. There's no greatness here. It's just because God put me in this situation. This is what I have to do. It's not, I, I can't take credit for it. Um, so it works both ways. If his request was not fulfilled, so now we're going to see the scenario where, okay, so he asked for something, he wanted something, and either the person who was, you know, quote unquote, more powerful or the person who was, quote unquote, subordinate didn't fulfill their, their request. He should not blame them. Again, going back to that angry point that I said before, there's no reason to get angry. Don't blame them, nor should he blame it on the lack of effort on their part, right? And the, that's that's a hard one, right? Like we, we get really upset, like why didn't this person put much more, more effort in helping me and this and that, right? But again, we, we're we're missing out on what God expects from us because again, it's God. We need to have that communication with God and not spend energy on getting upset at other people. Instead, he should thank God who chose to withhold his request from him for his own good, and he should praise the people of whom he made the request based on his knowledge of their efforts that they invested to fulfill his request, even though it did not materialize according to his wishes or the wishes of the people who wanted to help him. So if it didn't work out, you have to know that you have to still thank them for whatever effort they put to be part of this. This is how a person should conduct himself with his friends and acquaintances, as well as with those with whom he does business and with his servants and partners. Now, if somebody asks a request of you, so now you are, now, now we're going to flip the script. So somebody else needs something that you can presumably provide for them. Similarly, if either a superior or subordinate of his makes a request of him, he should wholeheartedly make every effort to perform it. But if possible, he should try to complete the request in private so that he will not become haughty as a result. So again, we have to be so careful with arrogance. The above only applies if a person who asked him for the request is someone who is deserving of his efforts on his behalf. I want to see, there's a note here who is deserving. He says here, one of the commentaries, the Tova Levanon, um, is one of the commentaries on the original Sefer, the original book, um, Shara B'Tachem, says that someone who is deserving here refers to someone who is upright and reputable. When it comes to the wicked, he is not obligated to look out for their good. Okay, so... Evidently, um, you know, I don't know how much we are able, meaning us common, you know, normal people right here to judge who is wicked and who is righteous and who deserves and doesn't deserve. But that's what the commentary is saying here, that there are going to be people who are righteous, who we should try to do everything possible to help. And then there's going to be wicked people that we don't have to look out for their good. Again, I'm not sure how much you and I can judge that because we, we can't, right? So, um, so it's interesting that he puts it here. And I will ask somebody about this because I'm actually very, very curious of, to see how others explain this, this because it doesn't, it, 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 if we go back to the principle of love your fellow as yourself, like how do I how do I how do I make a calculation again? It, it's it if if I'm just God's messenger, then I just have to do what God expects of me at, at a certain time. But I guess there are wicked people in the world, evidently, and maybe this is referring to misplaced kindness, which we know that in the case of the Jews, we have very often placed tons of misplaced kindness. Right there is there's a limit to how much there are boundaries. Right. And um, not to get all political, but we all know that sometimes we've been very, very, very overly kind to our enemies who just want to literally exterminate us completely, like literally kill us. So th there is, you know, th there are boundaries and there is a line for this, but we probably would get super off topic if we get into that. After making these efforts, he should rely on God to help him fulfill the person's request. So yeah, you're going to try your best. You always have to rely that on God to help you do what you need to do, right? How many times we've been in a situation where we're trying to help a friend or a colleague achieve something and it's becoming quite difficult. We have to have the perspective of like, God, please help me. Please help me do this. I don't know that I can do this. Very recently, somebody asked me to do something and I was like, 
I was like, I, I don't know that I can do this, right? Like I can only do this, God, if you help me do this because I don't see how I have bandwidth. I don't see how I have the capability. But on the other hand, if somebody asks you to do it, like, again, everybody should have a mentor that they talk to and a good friend and whatever. But just, just in big brush strokes, I'll say that if, if, if you're in a position to help somebody and, and you have to rely on God that he will help you through that. So again, it's the God consciousness and not the me consciousness. Because if it's just me alone, I could never help. You know, we have to think if it's it, it's on my power alone, who am I, right? Don't don't even think you're anybody. You're just carrying out God's will. You're just his messenger. If the request ends up being fulfilled through his efforts, because God placed him in the position of being the conduit for the other person's good, he should not attribute his success to himself. And he should not ask for recompense or thanks from the other person. Rather, he should thank God for choosing him to do this good for his friend. If, however, he was prevented from fulfilling their request and he was not able to do it, he should not blame himself. He should inform his friend that he was not lazy in his efforts on his behalf, provided that he did, in fact, exert himself and toil on this person's behalf. So this is a really good place to stop because now we're going to deal afterwards, we're going to deal with enemies <laughs> i guess the people that don't like maybe i just described them the people that don't want your good um and just to just to um remind everybody that really passover which we're about to celebrate and, and you know I, this this week is very hectic in many people's homes preparing for the big day but we have to remember that the passover is it's actually very interesting because you see how it's so meaningful for people, no matter where you are, like no matter where you are in your level of Jewish observance, I think Passover is like the Jewish holiday, right? Par excellence, like everybody somehow marks it in some way. And it really is because it is the holiday of faith, right? The, the matzah is the bread of faith. And it, it touches on that pristine, pure faith that is part of every single Jew. And when we sit on Friday night at the Seder, Friday night at the Seder, we have to actually try in our own way as much as we can to connect to, to, connect to the fact that this is what we're eating is the bread of, bread of faith. And the process that we're experiencing at the Seder is a process of nourishing that faith. And it's funny because we can get so distracted by, oh, my annoying cousin who came and my uncle who's just, you know, like there's all these family dynamics at Passover seders that people get so distracted by. And we forget that, that, that this is a time to tune all that out and go back to the basics and the fundamental. The fundamental is that you are one with God, that you are a piece of God, and that's your superpower and that God can do anything for you. And in fact, there's times during the Seder that are super, super appropriate. I don't have time to go through the Haggadah right now, but there's times during the Seder that are so, so appropriate to ask God for everything that one wants and needs. And obviously for the ultimate that I think we all realize that the whole world needs, like the whole world needs, needs Mashiach. We need a completely, a complete revelation already. Like we need the world to do a, a, a complete turnover although it's not really a complete turnover it's just kind of like a whoops like the screen just you know like uh like if you're in the theater and just the, the screen opens that's all that needs to happen really that's all that needs to happen but we need it to happen and we need it to happen really soon because then we'll have everything every other concern that we have is going to be resolved but nevertheless there are there are points in the seder where we can and we should pray and ask for all those things. So I know for women, it's sometimes very stressful because we have a lot of things to manage during a Seder and a lot of um, dynamics between guests and all the things. But if we could take some time somehow um, during the whole time to at least like connect and pray with our heart, full heart, um, we will see tremendous, tremendous success because as we say, our sages tell us that no prayer ever goes unanswered so use the time wisely and uh, may it be a real boost of emuna and and trust right um and then after the seder we will after passover i should say not after the seder so we won't have class 
next uh, next Monday, but then we'll have after. We won't have class next Sunday or wait. When when do we resume? I don't even know. Like I'm so like the sleep deprived. I'm so drugged with these allergy medicines. I can't even tell you. Oh yeah, we'll have class on Monday, the twenty fifth. Because now we're Pesach is going to be over. So I won't see you the 18th, but I will see you Monday the 25th, which is the 24th of Nissan. So any, not Tuesday. Why did I say Tuesday? No, Monday. Monday, Liz. Monday. Monday. Mean, Tuesday. Today is Tuesday. Oh, today's Tuesday. Thank you. Okay. See, I don't even know what day. I'm, I don't. Thank you, Annette. I don't even know what day. So we will see each other Tuesday the 26th. I told you I took so many allergy medicines today because I'm like, Sneeze. I don't know what's going on in Houston, but I've never had, I've never had it as bad as this spring. Thank you. Yes, we have classes on Tuesday. I thought we have class on Monday. Okay, that, that says a lot. Okay, Tuesdays, we shall continue with Tuesdays. I happen to love Tuesday. It's my favorite day of the week in general. It's a day that God said um, good twice in the Torah. One day I'll show you. Um, so it's, a, it's an awesome day. Have an amazing kosher and happy Pesach. And I will see you Tuesday, April 26th. I think I got that one right. Okay. Oh, you have a question, Annette. Go for it. <coughs> What's your question? You hear? Oh, didn't even realize I was still muted. I was muted. <laughs> it has to do with what you were talking about, about anger, which, yeah. which is my issue personally, mm. but in a, in a specific way. Mm. I don't generally explode over big things, over big things. I'm completely in control over big, what I call uh, kapara things, you know, when Hashem gives you a gazillion and one like big things or things that just seem insurmountable. No, completely in control, totally on it, can handle the big, big, scary stuff. Yeah. It's the little things. And I'm not talking about a kid knocked over the glass or this, that, or the other. It's, it's when people in your circle are simply driving you bonkers. Can I just share with you something? That's why I'm asking. I think every single one of us struggles with that. I think that is the real struggle in it. I think I, I, I can so relate to your struggle. I think that is the struggle. It's so much easier to apply bitachon and trust. You said I'm in control, but what you meant is like, I handle it smoothly and I, I know that God is in control, right? Like I see this in myself all the time. It's the little things, right? The big things, okay, God, you got this. Like it's, 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 yeah, there's no, but why? Because we we are we've bought into the illusion that we are in control, so because we've bought into that illusion, we think that we can we we're in control. Like, why is that person behaving like that? They shouldn't behave like that. Like, they shouldn't be like that, right? And and my kid shouldn't do this, and my sister shouldn't do that, like, right? But it's all an illusion. So when we can when we can't control the little things then we totally go bonkers. Like you said, like we know we have no control over things that God forbid are really tragic. Like if somebody's ill or something, that's very painful. But at that moment, like there's nothing I can do, right? But because we think there was always something we could do, right? About those normal everyday little things, right? Then when they don't go the way that we expected them to go, we lose it, right? So I think, and this is why this is what we learn. So don't feel bad and think that you're the only one. I'm raising my hand. I'm exactly the same way. I'm pretty sure most of us are that way because again, that's how we operate. We operate controlling, controlling, right? The things around us. And when they don't go our way, then we have a really hard time with it and we get really stressed. And we have pent up uh, emotions and anger and frustration. And then we explode at people, right? We, at that, those, at that moment, what we're doing is we're leaving God out of the picture, right? So when the part of the work, that's why it's avoda, it's work, it's going back to trust. It's going back to, no, God isn't, if, if this is happening, it's not personal. It's not this person. It's. God, you're with me. Evidently, you want this for me. Okay, I'm trusting that this is good. I get it, right? It doesn't feel really good right now that this friend of mine, you know, did this 
not nice thing or whatever the little thing is that is, you know, so aggravating, right? We have to bring God back into the equation. Obviously easier said than done. But if we go back to, I want you to re, to listen to that first episode of the podcast, the Gate of Trust podcast. I don't know if you were on the call when I said that it launched um, last yesterday. Um, I, I, and saw, it, um, I just, I saw a link to it and that's, I got confused and that's the one I was trying to get into tonight. Oh. And I was waiting for the host to let me in, you know, and then I realized I'm in the wrong spot. And then, sure. and then she. And then I messaged Sherry, I, I, I can't get in, okay. I, I'm on the wrong one. And then so she sent me. So I'm glad you found us. But on, uh, in addition to that, I sent another link in one of the niche, whatever, I, Houston chats about a podcast and that podcast, the Gate of Trust podcast, which is based on this book. The first interview is with the sponsors of this edition of the book. And uh, one of the things that she experienced where she said like she really at that moment, it was a life or death moment. I'm not going to give it away right now, but basically she said, oh my gosh, this is the moment. This is the moment where I could go back to how I usually react or I could feel safe. Obviously this happened in a split second. And he says, and she, she said, and I feel safe. I am safe. And you have to listen to get this, but it's exactly how it is. The, but but I, I have to say that it didn't happen out of thin air. She had been learning this book already for years every morning with her husband, so much so that they became the sponsors of the book, right? But she says, I at that moment of life and death, I realized this is it. Like now, this is when I could either go back to the old control freak and the old worry and, and, and habit or I could feel completely safe and she she went to that place she went to that place I don't I can't tell you because it's very personal and I don't know like how do we do that other than experience it but from her story we can see very clearly that it only happens kind of like SEO search engine optimization because it's front and center. So we have, because we've had so many years of the habituation of the knee jerk reaction and the anger and the frustration and the, you know, the trying to control, right? Like I can control everything, right? And the, and, and, and worrying all of the things that are contrary to trust in God, right? In order to, in order to bypass that, we need to fill ourselves with new neural neural pathways, literally, right? This is why the Lubavitcher Rebbe said, don't, don't learn the book once, learn it two or three times. Like in order to change the neural pathways that you, we've created over the years. And by the way, it's not just that we've created it. Like they said on the interview, and we all know because we watch the news, the world is trying. That's what the world is selling us constantly. You should, you should panic. You should freak out. You should, right? That's exactly where the, where, the, where the world wants you to be. And we as Jews need to say, no, no, no. There's another emotional state. There's something called trust. And I can go there. But again, for all of us who are trying to do this, we need to know that it's a work in progress. And that being here and having this conversation and learning once a week or picking a page a day with our husbands or listening to the podcast that's exactly what we're doing we're creating a new neural pathway so that when the situation arises and it will arise because we live in a world that god sends challenges right by default until mashiach comes that's the way it's going to be but it's how we're going to deal with the challenges right how, how do we operate um so that's my answer, which is not the answer of, oh, no, here, I have a solution. But I was going to do is, I was going to give you um, what I want. No, that was a, that was a very good answer. Then I, if, if I could please ask you a follow-up question. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little scenario, and I want you to tell me how you would apply the book. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. Okay, Every, so everybody else, if I need a life, like, what's that game? What's the game when you ask a lifeline? You know, there was a, one of those game shows. Um, yeah, yeah. And ask oh, for, oh, for right. I'll be asking. Yeah, let's hear. Let's hear a scenario. That's good. A friend who you love and respect, right, asks for your advice on something or asks your, like, your opinion on something, either one, okay? And you give them a response. 
And then they follow up with basically asking you the same question, slightly different way, but it's the same question and you essentially give the same response. Mm -hmm. And then they'll tell you something, you know, that's about all of that. And they'll ask you something and essentially they're still asking and you still have the same response. Mm -hmm. And then by the fourth time your response, your voice is now starting, my voice is now starting to get raised because I, I don't know what else. To, it's like, how do you like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like without getting upset or annoyed or very, you know, raising your voice because you're now getting irritated because your response is not going to change no matter how they ask the question mm -hmm. or how they ask your opinion you've given it and given it and given it and you're thinking to yourself this is a really smart intelligent person what part of your response do they not understand right so i think this has to do a lot with having the and I know this is going to be, this is hard for us to practice at that moment, but if we discuss it now, hopefully when we come across these situations again, which inevitably we will, there are people who are a little bit difficult right in life, but having the empathy to, to say, oh, this person's obviously not ready for my answer. And my answer is not clicking, but because it's not about me, it's about them, right? So we have to set our ego aside and understand that, right? Because the part that gets upset is the ego part who's thinking, but I gave her a really good advice. Why is she not keeping to it? Why is she not getting it, right? That's the ego. But if okay. we, let, we, we put ourselves aside and we realize, wow, she's not ready. Maybe all she needs is a hug. Or maybe all she needs is for me to change the conversation to something else so that her mind gets distracted from this thing that's evidently consuming her, but she can't even grasp the advice yet, right? So I would ask myself those questions and how to put healthy boundaries so that I don't have to get frustrated and the person got as much help as I could, right? Humanly possible, evidently they're not ready. And then how can I just continue in this relationship without the anger, the resentment, and, and be in a place where we can be past that, right? So maybe it's, you know, like sometimes, sometimes this happens with family members, Annette, like, sometimes we have family members that there's a certain part of our life that it just, like, it's always going to have friction, right? So in order to keep peace, I'm sure everybody's familiar with this, we have to, it's, it's one or the other, it's, it's like, do you want to be right? Or do you want to be happy? Do you know what I mean? Right? Do you want to want to actually have a relationship with this person, a positive relationship, or do you want to be right? And evidently, we try to have healthy, positive relationships. So sometimes we have to navigate the relationship in a way that there's parts that we don't even discuss anymore at some point because we set a boundary so that we don't have to go to that dark place only because it's not a dark place for you, but the other person is not ready to appreciate or to engage in that part of the conversation on that part of the relationship so it's similar to what you're asking me right this friend is not ready so it's not clicking so you're seeing that saying it again and again it's not clicking so we gotta divert you know what i mean we gotta divert and find subtle and sometimes with some people it doesn't have to be subtle it can be a little bit more blunt right like oh, I, I i see that you're stuck still in this situation i also see that i gave you what i think is my best advice. Let me know how it works out for you. Um, I hope, I'm sh I hope you come up with the best solution. You know what I mean? Like kind of like we have to wish them well and then move on because if we want to have the relationship again, right? Because it's at the end of the day, it's not about us. It's about them. So we, we, again, God has put us in a place where we gave the advice and the person is not ready to receive. Okay. That's, that's the situation. There's not much that I can do other than empathize and recognize, wow, they're not ready, but I still love them. And I still can do, I can still send them a Starbucks gift card, or I still can, you know, invite them to a movie. Or, you know what I mean? Like there's other ways to have this positive relationship that don't involve this, this sticking point because they're not ready. So, okay, when they're ready, they'll be ready. Or maybe they'll find better advice somewhere else. But we do have to set clear boundaries if we don't want this to become a whole toxic loop.
Okay. I hope that's helpful. All right, guys. That was Dr. really very, very helpful. Thank oh. you very much. I appreciate it. Liz, you have a question? Can I no can I add something? I was thinking about uh, what uh, Annette and us ask. Uh, some I think some people uh, who is asking for advice and probably one or two or three times, people when uh, they are asking for advice, many times they know the answer and, and probably they have the answer, even though if that answer is different than yours and you should also respect that answer, but sometimes they, they have the answer and sometimes they, they are needing someone to listen to them for them to, uh, to talk their, their answer. And then uh, while they're talking, uh, they can confront the, their own ideas and to, to confirm if it's right or to confirm if uh, it is wrong. So probably, basically that would be easy if, if uh, it's a second or third time, uh, just uh, change back the, the, the question, like saying like, what, what, what advice could you uh, will be giving to yourself in that situation and let them, let them talk and elaborate their idea? Yeah, I love that, right? Okay, I, well, this, is, this is what I would do. What would you do? I, right. I, I heard you ask me several times. I'm curious, what would you do? And just listen, sometimes that's what they need. They just need a listening ear. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Oh, oh my gosh. I hope that works out for you. I would have never thought of that, you know? <laughs> Right. It's taken years because I'm I'm um, like solution oriented. That's my nature. If somebody asks me for help or advice or this or that, my brain immediately goes to how can I solve this? You know, how can I help them achieve this? Whatever Solu solution oriented. And with your children, that's very very hard because very right. often. And I have like when, with grown children in particular, little children, depending upon what they want, it's, it's different. Grown children, big, you know, grown up situations, you know, adult situations. And, and so I've, I'm, it's taking, and I'm, I can't say I do it all the time, but there are times now where I am better about, they don't want my opinion, even though they're asking my opinion, mm -hmm. they really just want to tell me or vent or talk it through, or be upset about whatever they're upset with. And that's when I do that, uh-huh, I see, you know, and, and trying really hard to implement that, me not giving, trying to give them an answer or a solution, which I can't always do, it depends on the situation, but I'm trying much more to do that right. Right. because they really don't, they really don't want me to solve it for them, even though that's what they, they that's say. what they're, they're, that's what they say when they when they call exactly right exactly right but right. thank you right. so so much this was right. really wonderful and i was just going to make one quick comment on the aseta aseta <laughs> <laughs> who goes who go to the town with a wife and children for their needs <laughs> there was I know you've traveled, you've traveled for work in years, like you've traveled for work before, right? And your husband has traveled for work before, but I had never really, I had not done that very much, but there was a, this one period of time for about six weeks, I was working in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. Okay. For about six weeks. And the company would fly me home every other Shabbos yeah. to be in Houston. Okay. But because of the way the flights worked and they weren't direct flights from Indianapolis to Houston, and it was winter time in the middle of winter, by the time I get home, it's getting very close to getting ready for Shabbos. So I'm not walking in the door and being able to prepare or do anything. So for this six week period and those handful of Shabbos, Kenny had to manage the kids and manage the house and manage the homework and manage the laundry and manage the food. And all I did was work and deal with whatever I was dealing with. But in that six weeks, I didn't lose one sock. <laughs> right. I didn't have to supervise homework. Right. I had my own work done. I didn't have to do anybody's laundry, but mine. I didn't have to worry about right. food for anybody but me. And I didn't even have to worry about shoppers. Either Kenny either had to make plans where we went somewhere or he better make it or pick it up because I wasn't going to be there to get it done on those few shoppers. And it was the first time in my life, really in my life where I lived by myself. And I know for people who live by themselves all the time, that's a very, very different 
scenario. You know, very, very, and they either really like it or they really don't. But during that time period, I can see what these people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but that's exactly, I love that example because that's exactly what he's trying to say. So whatever the situation is, see that there is some positive that God wants you in these six, six weeks to not have these responsibilities over matching socks and over lunch boxes and over, you know, oh. homework and field trip slips and whatever it is, right? And be okay with that because this is good for you right now. And when you are in the situation where you have to cook and you have to do the laundry and you have to take carpool everybody around, you have to also be happy in that situation because it's what God wants. You have to trust that this is what God wants from you at this moment and not panic. In either situation, the no panic. That's, that's, the, that's the recipe. All right, guys. Have, have a kosher one- and happy. Hey, kosher grower. Hey, uh, and, uh, bye. Enjoy. Bye bye.